Hello, and welcome to Dig It. I'm Peter Brown, and hosting the show with me today is Chris Day. Hi, Chris. Hi, Peter. Cathy Brown Gardens in Bedfordshire, and together with her husband Simon, have created a wonderful private garden at Stebbington, just north of Bedford, which they opened to the public. Cathy is an author, a lecturer in gardening, a baker of amazing cakes, and a wonderful, passionate plants person. Cathy, a very warm welcome to Dig It today, and I suspect we probably find you in your garden. Uh, well, I'm waiting for the, a group to come this afternoon, Chris. Um, we have we're open on a Tuesday, but we have private groups on other days. So. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm glad that the, the weather the forecast for this afternoon is a bit drier. <laughs> you were just saying, just before we, we, we started recording, you had a bit of a, uh, a hellish yesterday, um, I suppose, with the weather changing. That's one thing, when you open your garden, you, you are in the, the sort of lap of the gods. Well, the morning was absolutely super. I had lots and lots of people booked in. And the afternoon, we had a deluge to begin with, but we all wanted it. So I, I don't think there was a person there who really minded, That's except it. it wasn't the best weather for <laughs> going round. But it, it, the sun came out and it was fine afterwards. But it probably cooled the temperature down a little bit, didn't it? And it made it a little bit pre- more pleasant in the afternoon for the, for the garden. I felt like dancing around. It was beautiful <laughs> after that horrible... <laughs> Sticky, hot weekend. Yeah, no, it, it, it certainly has been hot, hasn't it? So perhaps, uh, Cathy, we could uh, begin by uh, you telling us how you first got into gardening. Well, I had a love of it from childhood. My mother was keen on the garden and flower arranging, and I sometimes went with her to classes as a teenager, which is probably unusual. Mm. But it wasn't until I was married and we had our own garden in Highgate that we were able to put any gardening tips in or gardening into practice. Okay. And Simon, my husband, was just as keen as, as I was. And it really took off after I left. Well, I had a, had children. We were married and I was pregnant with Jonathan and left the Bank of England where I was working right. and set up a little business in Highgate planting containers for people. Okay. So that's how I started. Brilliant. And Peter, I've, I've visited, obviously, Cathy's garden a, a number of times, but uh, perhaps, Cathy, you could explain how your, your current garden has, has sort of developed over the years. Did you have a, a master plan at the start, or, or did it just sort of happen and evolve? <laughs> <laughs> Chris, you'd laugh. I, when we moved from Haiti to here in 1987, we had two lorries, one of furniture and one of pots, <laughs> because I was in the middle I was in the middle of writing my second book on container gardening and I couldn't leave them behind. So they And they can't be stacked on top of one another when they're in full growth. <laughs> so uh, a second lorry came. And to begin with, we didn't do much in the garden at all because we had two tiny children and most of the garden was taken up with a donkey who <laughs> came free with a house or the other way around. Wow. And she lived here for... <laughs> she lived here for four years and eventually died age 40. And yeah. once she died, we were able to take away the fence, the donkey fence panel, and realise we had a wonderful view and made the most of it by creating a formal garden from the end of the house. So that's what started us off, really. Excellent. And whilst you've been creating this new garden, did you come across any major problems with the development of it? Um well, we're on heavy clay soil, so it has been really difficult to plant in the first place. And you only want to plant once. Um, but we we were found ourselves in quite a windy spot. I, I wasn't used to that in North London. And we tried to put in hedging, but beach is quite slow to get going on heavy soil. It has done, and we've got a, a perimeter hedge of beach. But we wanted to establish other trees as well so we we were able to buy some extra land and actually planted eucalyptus which were fast growing and evergreen different species from tasmania which we thought would be okay here and also pine trees so they're both evergreen both in the southwest corner of the garden and over the years they've grown up and created a lot of shelter for us so, Cathy, you, you, you did you just mentioned about the sort of trees. You, quite a large number have gone in over the years. 
we're really lucky because we've had this space in the garden where there has been nothing but grass. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to go out like pioneers and, and plant it up. And we've been really keen on certain trees. One of them is the white stem birch, which you could see at Anglesey Abbey. It's, it's absolutely fabulous. Beautiful in tree. In the winter garden there. Yeah. But we actually first saw it at Euro Disney, believe it or not. When the children were tiny, Euro Disney opened in mm -hmm. Paris. Mm -hmm. And the planting there was absolutely wonderful. And there were a lot of white stem birches planted close to each other. And that gave us the idea to plant them here. Well, you could go to Anglesey Abbey and you can see them there. And it's roughly the same time that we planted ours as they planted theirs. And they're a fabulous tree to have. Mm -hmm. And beautiful in the summer, but... In the winter, with the low light catching them, they are sensational. I do. We've also managed to plant ginkgos, which are a super tree in the autumn here. We're on heavy clay, and we don't get you know, the lovely colour of aces, for example, but with the ginkgos, mm. they turn a buttercup yellow, and mm. the metasequoias turn a russet orange. So those two trees. Um, are, are great. Yeah, that's say those those other those two trees you mentioned. The last two are, of course, conifers, aren't they? So, um, which, yes, which they're unusual. Yeah, uh, certainly because they're one, two of the oldest in the world known in fossils, mm. and they're they're deciduous. They're not evergreen. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So sorry, you, you're saying about the areas you had. You you like to use sort of avenues and to sort of develop uh, sort of vistas. Has that been an important part yeah. of the, the garden? It is because the the house the, the house is is a farmhouse built by the Duke of Bedford in 1876, and its orientation is roughly south southwest, and so we're able to pick up the setting sun in one direction in the summertime, and that's where the white stem birches lead out to a wildflower meadow, and on the other side, there's an avenue. Well, there's arches of wisterias leading. To a weeping cedar and so the orientation of the garden is beautiful with the light which is, is lucky for us because I mean it was a greenfield site and more or less and we were we were able to think that through and it's exciting now after all these years that the trees are beginning to grow lovely yes the actual ginkgos and pines are not the fastest growing trees are they but I guess after what, 40 odd years they must be quite it's a half half their full size by now well the, the ginkgos are probably the youngest of, of the ones we put in but the ne nearby are some eucalyptus which are fast growing yeah. and we really chose them because they're evergreen and fast growing and would create good shelter so that's really helped the garden because it's a windy area in east anglia isn't it it's certainly you're is, further yeah. over to the west than than i am but it it is windy mm. and with climate change, people talk about they talk about the heat and the sun, but they don't talk so much about the wind. And we've had a lot of wind through last winter and into this year, haven't we? Indeed, yes. And it can be so damaging and it dries everything out. And obviously, big trees get blown mm -hmm. over. And yeah, you certainly see it around here. The storms a few months back, um, last year, should I say now? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we certainly lost a lot of trees around here. So, Cathy, whilst we're doing our research, we, we spotted that the Banner House Gardens had been voted the regional winners in the east of the nation's favourite top garden competition, which is obviously organised by the, the National Garden Scheme and the English Garden Magazine. Uh, that must be, make you feel really proud. <laughs> it was a surprise, Chris. It was a total <laughs> surprise. But it was lovely. And uh, we've been opening for the National Garden Scheme for probably 25 years. Mm -hmm. And it's what really started us opening the garden. And I, I, I feel as I owe a great debt to them because if you start opening, then the next year they think, oh, well, I want to do something better and you know, make it more exciting. And so it, it's a bit of a drug, really, but um, it got us going. And we had a great response early in the early days. And a team of people in the village used to help with the, the teas. And it was a really, really happy day. Yeah. I, I mean, to me, the, you know, the prospect of over my garden, um, I mean, it's quite a big big sort of leap of faith, isn't it? Don't you think? Or, or does it say you, <laughs> you just sort of thought, well, actually, we've got a lovely garden here and we want to enjoy it and share it with other people, I suppose. Well, that, 
that's very much part of it, the sharing. Um, we were a little bit worried about security to begin with, mm-hmm. and a couple of friends came and were in the garden as well, just keeping an eye on things. But over the years, the people are really, really mm-hmm. nice that come to gardens, and generally speaking, we've had no litter, we've had no no debris. You know, it's just been a lovely, a lovely day, and it still is when people come. I think they're just happy to meet friends and be in somebody else's, you know, they, we're obviously doing the work, not them. Mm-hmm. And it's just a chance to wander around and have a nice cup of tea and a piece of cake and enjoy it. Well, it this really has been is. particularly true in COVID yeah. because we were still open. We were allowed to open. And the number of people who met up for the first time, you know, we were able to see their daughters or grandparents and come together. It was the, the, the family outing returned during COVID, which was wonderful. And a yeah. lot more younger people came to the garden as well. No, it really was. And I think the other thing that I certainly always get out of going and visiting gardens is you get inspired because you've created a fantastic garden that you've opened up and now I can come along and have a look at it and get some ideas about, oh, I wonder if I could do that. I mean, my garden's only sort of 30 metres long by 10 metres wide, so possibly not quite big enough for a nice avenue of trees or uh, 250 no. trees. But you still get the idea of well, creating vistas can be a really, I think, a, a lovely idea, and especially if you've got a nice view and you can draw the eye along that sort of, uh, towards that view, you can often create really fantastic uh, inspirational gardens, can't you? Yeah, I don't want to give you the impression that the tree, <laughs> we have done that over the years, but there, this garden is made up of many different areas and we try and create a view or a, an eye catcher, like a bench or something yep. to, to see almost around every corner. So it it. It can you can see it as smaller scale, I'm sure. Yeah. And with the pergolas and the arches, you know, it, it becomes an individual look to the garden. I, I once wrote a book called Create a, a Cottage Garden, and there were only eight plants per scene. And somebody reminded me of it yesterday that um, she'd followed it and been really enjoyed it, and so. To, to think of a garden without there being too many plants involved, because that, to a, a novice gardener, that can be overwhelming, can't it? Because you don't know the names of the plants to start yeah. off with. And that's true of containers, that if you can name four plants that are in a container, well, or even two or even one, then somebody with a photograph of that container can go away and reproduce it without feeling overwhelmed or too worried about it or without it being too expensive that's very true you, you've clearly created your garden with sort of different areas and it's got a good diversity in, in the garden have you got any favorite parts of your garden or is the whole thing your whole <laughs> you're happy with the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> well it varies through the year because some some parts excel in spring and others in midsummer so Wildflower meadow, for example, I planted over 20 years ago as a millennium project, hand sowed it. And oh, wow. it's super <laughs> in April with cowslips. And it's super now with scabious and knapweed. But my husband, Simon, has mown an area just up the drive where the donkey used to be. And, you know, it's a glorious patch of buttercups in May and then goes on to other things. So he's not sown a single thing there, but it looked absolutely gorgeous. Um, but that's just the time of year. That's May and the other one's July. And yep. at the moment, I've adapted an area to be a xeriscape of succulents mm-hmm. around a little um, water feature that we have. I've had these succulents for years, but I've suddenly decided to bed them out. And it's created quite an eye catcher of different foliage shapes and colours of the um, of the leaves, and it's fun. I, I'm enjoying it. Brilliant. Um, it's a bit strange, but I quite like that because it's a bit of fun in the garden. Yeah, I was going to say, Cathy, it's, it's a new palette of plants to have to uh, manipulate and manage, isn't it? As well, which is part of the fun, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm lucky, Chris, because I have a we we inherited a a very large greenhouse when we came. It's called a solar dome. Mm-hmm. So think of a, a domed greenhouse rather than the traditional shape. 
and I'm able to move the succulents in there in the winter time to keep them um, nice and happy. Yeah. So I've got I've got that space. Yes. Which is lucky. Uh, yeah, Kathy. Well, you know, walking around your garden, um, you know, you have to beg the question of of maintenance. So is it a case of Team Brown getting stuck in on the day to day stuff, uh, the routines and the chores? Yeah, very much so. We have help in the garden once a week by say one day a week in the garden so the rest of it is down to us and Simon's in charge of all the the grass and the edges <laughs> and the hedges and uh, the topiary loves doing the topiary and is really good at it um I tend to do the weeding which is oh, boring okay. isn't it but also the color combinations um and the planting mm. not not the long-term planting like the trees or the the topiary but the the colour planting, really, for yeah, the, the dahlias stuff. and the cosmos and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. But we're we're very much a a team talking things through. I mean, we don't do things overnight, and it tends to be that we think about it for a while and then do it in the winter months so that mm. it's ready for opening in the spring. We've had a new project this year, which you you'd smile about. We took out a mullion window of the house, which had only been put in in the 1930s, and for in order to add a conservatory. And for 20 years, this mullion window has been under a tarpaulin. But this year, we decided to erect it. And um, there was a vine growing up the the, uh, the barns, which we've managed to train over. And now it's like a, a an open mullion window looking into the garden. It's rather lovely. Mm-hmm. But it's taken us years to do anything with it. I mean, We've just, it's been under a tarpaulin and doing absolutely nothing. So all of a sudden you make the decision, you find somebody who can do it and bingo, there it is. Yeah. So that's one of our projects this year. That sounds great. And obviously we were talking about the weather earlier. How have you been coping, or how's the garden been coping with the lack of rain? Well, you learn several things about your garden, don't you? But where you have shade and you think, oh, it's all that shade. Actually, the plants in the shade do far better in this hot, sunny summer that we've had. And you begin to value it. And we have two walnut trees that were here when we first came. And they've provided massive shade for all our visitors, which is excellent. But Beth Chateau um, was was a great teacher. I don't know whether that was a millennium project she had, but when she converted her tarmac... Um, car park into a gravel garden and we saw it and we have roughly the same rainfall as she did I mean it's pretty close to 20 inches a year so it's low very low as a norm and I've got several areas of gravel where I followed her ideas and bought plants from her but also at the same time Pete Aldorf was extolling the ideas of a naturalistic garden Mm -hmm. And the use of grasses and certain perennials. And I've picked from some of those plants and simplified it. So the grasses don't need the water and the sedums don't and Verbena bonariensis doesn't. Echinaceas don't on the whole, but they have had help this year for me. Um, But those gardens have survived and looked really good. And we've got several major ornamental grass gardens, which come into their own in this time of year and last all through the winter. And we've got a, a winter project. Well, we've got an article being written in Homes and Gardens on our winter garden. So you look at it in the summer and you think, ah, oh, that's really lovely with the grasses swaying in the colour. Mm-hmm. And then you realise that this is a winter garden because when the frost is on the seed heads and on the grasses oh, and they're swaying in the winter, it's oh, absolutely beautiful. super. It's mesmerising. So, and with the white stem birches as well, it's, it, this is a lovely winter garden. So I'm not sure I answered your question there. No, but... <laughs> no, no. I mean, it, I think you've made the point very clearly yeah. that fundamentally some plants, like the sedums and the, the succulents, do fantastically mm. well in dry weather. And it, 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 if you had a garden full of uh, bog plants, you might have been <laughs> struggling this year. <laughs> Just a bit, yeah. And yeah. That, yeah, and I suppose that concurs with what we're selling, you know, at the garden centre over the moment. There's a lot of interesting grasses, and obviously the late colour perennials like the echinaceas, um, Granted, yeah, they need a bit of water to get them established and perhaps a, a little bit of a helping hand deadheading, but they're, they're fine plants for, for the heat, aren't they? 
Well, they're, they're used to the open sunshine of the grasslands, aren't they? The prairies mm. or the savanna lands. Mm. Um, so that, that is their home ground. Um, it's tested them a bit, I have yeah. to say, but we, we put a tarpaulin down mm-hmm. and then covered it with gravel when okay. we planted originally. And in that area, these echinaceas have self-seeded like mad, whereas mm. in my main borders, they would hardly survive. I don't think they like being crowded out for one thing. Mm. But out there, they just self-seed and uh, they've coped really well over, this is over 12 years. Mm. So uh, that's a good news. Yeah, it is. Do you think, Cathy, you, you, you'd be plan, you know, making plans to um, look at climate change and, and that type of planting elsewhere in, in future years? Do you think that's going to be an important? Well, mm, Chris, you, you look around the garden and you realise there's weak areas particularly this summer and where I've got lots of arches with wisteria and laburnum and roses over with late flower and clematis and underneath there's masses of alliums which then are taken over by white Japanese anemones. Mm -hmm. Normally the white Japanese anemones create a beautiful hedge on either side but this year on the south side where they've been blasted by the sun really scorched they're much weaker so I can't have one side white Japanese anemones and the other side grasses, can I? No. <laughs> but I will have to think something that is more attuned with the summer sun than these white Japanese anemones, which this year have not done so well. But who knows what next year is going to bring. We'll probably have rain. I thought when they said climate change, I thought they said we'd have a lot more rainfall, to be honest. So. Yeah. I don't know. People can't predict, can they? No, we can't. We're all in that predicament as well, aren't we? That uh, extremes of weather is seems to be what we're getting. One one thing I would say has been really good, and I would use it again and again, is a Calamagrostis grass mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. called Overdam. It grows about four feet high, and it's variegated. So, from when it's we cut them down at the end of February, early March, and when they're growing back up getting going in April and May. These variegated leaves look very pretty. And then it's one of the first grasses to flower. And those flower heads will last, seed heads will last all through the winter. And it's not too tall and it's see-through. And even though it bends in the rain or the wind, next day it will be bolt upright. So I can't talk, it doesn't sell seed. It doesn't grow you know, any bigger than it says on the, on the, the, the label. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a wonderful plant and it's lasted for 12 years so far in the same place it seems to just live on and live on so that's a plant i may well use where i'm struggling in dry areas perfect great tip thank you kathy we you've written a number of gardening books over the years um the edible flower garden kathy brown's recipe for easy containers container gardening which are those wonderful sort of step-by-step recipe styles uh the gardener's guide to bulbs and the bulls for all seasons I've really enjoyed your books, and actually, whilst we're recording this, I've been having a thun through your creating a cottage garden, your bull for all seasons. But when this this whole idea of, of recipe style, when did that come about? Because it's it's quite unique in a gardening book. <laughs> yeah, I invented it back in the early, well, in, in the late nineteen eighties when mm. I was I had a business in London, and we called ourselves Bloom in Boxes. So we just went round seasonally to people knocking on doors saying could we plant their hanging baskets or their window boxes etc but people wanted to know really how to do it themselves but they hadn't a clue about the name so I thought if I could create a book like the old Hamlin colour cookbook where on every page there were four photographs with a list of ingredients of how to create that that um, the food if I could do that for containers then everybody would be able to identify with it very easily, women in particular, but also all the men too with the rest of the books. And so uh, Michael Joseph agreed to, to, to publish it. And so the recipe format was born. Mm. Nobody else had done it. And it, it just took off because people could identify with it very easily. So it was a list of ingredients, method of planting and aftercare. And that was simple, really. That's... And then I did it with with the cottage garden recipes. Um, and eventually I did it with edible flowers. So 
I did a book where you it went through different flowers that we could eat, but how to grow them as well as recipes for eating them. And that has never been out of print in 20 years, which is amazing, wow. really. It is. It's a massive achievement, isn't it? Your garden features lots of lovely containers. What's the fascination with the container garden? And is it just something that's evolved from your time in London and you've had the opportunity to build and build and build and try different things? I mean, where where's it all sort of come from? Well, it, it is that, that it's been a progression and it's been a fashion, hasn't it, for the last 40 odd years it's mm. just grown and grown because mm-hmm. people with smaller gardens and older people can just focus so with smaller gardens that's probably all you can do busy people working um it's it's a relief to come back and look after a few containers rather than a whole garden and for me the fascination is that you can change the color scheme the colors for me are very important or the foliage patterns are very important so and another thing is that you can raise the plants up. You can have one single plant on its own, raised on a on a table, and it can look fabulous. Whereas down in the ground, I, I, for an example, Dicentra spectabilis, the bleeding heart. Mine never do well in the garden. Perhaps it's because we've got the heavy soil. But in a container, raised on a on a table, top of a table, against a dark background, the little hearts show up wonderfully or against the sun in the background that backlit it's beautiful too so i'm all in favor of raising things up hostas for example i've got huge chandelier hanging basket of hostas at the moment slugs and snails haven't learned to fly in bed yet, so. <laughs> give them time <laughs> they'll go up the wall and <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> No, but it's hanging from a tree. So Brilliant. It's hanging from a tree, so they, they can't do that. And it's in partial shade. And uh, it's mad. It's totally mad because it's got grasses in it as well as, uh, as what else has it got? Creeping Jenny and all sorts of things. Mm. But it looks really lovely. And um, so I, I like, I mean, I planted up a tennis racket, for goodness sake. I was willing on and Andy Murray for the Olympics. And it's still planted up with succulents. Have you ever thought of planting a tennis racket? No. <laughs> or a chair or a telephone or, you know, I'm, I'm a bit mad. But anyway, there we are. <laughs> no. uh, it's fun. No, you're very creative and I think that's the thing. Do you, I mean, talking about planters themselves, do you have any sort of a, a favourite type of plant or does anything go in the in the garden? Well, if I was thinking of summer, this mm. is unusual what I'm going to say, but if I was thinking of summer... Then gladioli, there is, an, a plant has changed its name from acidanthra to gladioli muroli. Mm-hmm. You come across it. It's mm-hmm. a corm that's sold in late winter, spring. Yep. And it comes from Ethiopia, and it's a tall, white, dangling gladioli, which is just so dainty and scented. And it will, it's got sword-like leaves, and it's excellent in a container. But the container can be dropped into the border if you've got a gap, which I have in the borders. So I've got several dotted around. Or I've got them all around a fish pond. And Mm. they're looking very, if I may say so, they're looking very elegant. They've got these sword-like leaves. So a bit grass-like leaves around the fish pond. And and I think they're a wonderful plant to have. And they're cheap to buy, relatively. And I've had them three years now. Just keep overwintering them in pots. And I think that's a super yeah. choice, but probably not well known. No, it's it's one we do we do sell at the garden centre. I think, it, and you say it comes out. We get them in just after Christmas when the the good old sea yeah. potatoes arrive. And uh, yeah, it's it's uh, yeah it's one which which is, is quite popular now. I think with the I think it was Taylor's bulbs uh, have introduced it to to the to the gardener, which is which is good. And for if you were asking me for winter containers, mm. I know everybody plants tulips and other smaller bulbs and that's great mm-hmm. unless you've got monk jack coming through the garden <laughs> which some of us do mm-hmm. yeah. um, but i i think I, i'm sold on perennials and there's a hellebore new sort of hellebore which has been available for the last few years called the gold collection mm-hmm. 
And these hellebores are outward facing flowers, which start in December and they're still going in March. They're expensive mm -hmm. to buy in the garden centers, but they'll live from year to year in containers very happily. And if you plant them up with some other evergreens like periwinkle or mm -hmm. Viburnum tinus, you know, you, you, depending on the size of the container, they could just be on their own or they could be with something else. And for me, they give color at that time in the winter when there's not much else is in flower. And very few bulbs are in flower in December or January or even February to make a big splash. I mean, there is one called Frosty, which I planted with snowdrops and little um, thinkers coming over the side. And mm. they've been so beautiful. Um, or even violets, dig some violets up from the garden and add as an understory beneath the beneath the hellebores. Um, but I think they're a great addition. There's great invention because they're outward facing and they last for so long. And even the seed heads are very pretty. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Yeah, I'll have to have a look out for those, uh, Kathy. Thank you. Excellent. And I suppose with containers, I mean, you've had a massive amount of experience. What are your thoughts about best sort of composts to grow or, or to use for uh, for containers, and obviously these days we're now moving on to peat-free composts. Have you sort of tried any of those out yet, and had any experience of them yet? I I am not the best person to ask this question to because I have tried the peat-free, yep. and I haven't been successful. So I should. Uh, what would you recommend? Well, because I I haven't had successes yet. Um, Dalefoot uh, is, seems to be one of the mm. more popular ones, can I say, at the garden centre. I mean, uh, at the moment, we're obviously in this transition phase where we've got a, was it a year left mm. now? A couple of years, couple think, years yeah. left yeah. before I think we'll find peat totally disappears off the shelves. Jack's Magic is one that mm -hmm. is, I think, 50% 50 50%, um, yeah. peat and 50% non, uh, non peat. So that one is very popular. But from what we've picked up so far, it's about getting them wet enough and not letting them dry out. Um, Chris has done some trials mm. with, I think, four different yeah. composts this year, was it, Chris? Yeah, I tried. Um a number of products are home base. Their their product was 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 reasonably good, and a couple of the the the, the budget supermarkets as well, and people like B and Q. But actually, there's a, a product called New Horizon. Uh, it's a Westland product. That one is is peat free, and that's quite reasonable to work with. But as as Peter was just saying, just make sure you add some wetting agents, some uh, swell gel or a bit of uh, broadleaf P four to the to it and maybe add a little bit of um i mean i've been trying actually in the last few weeks using a little bit of john in his as well john in his in three sort of 10 15 percent and that seems to help the the like the porosity the the water holding qualities of the compost because obviously at the end of the day it's not got peat in it so it's not going to act like a sponge like our normal peat free you know peat based mm. compost have done and that's the 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 problem i think in getting used to managing your pots and the amount of water you're going to have to give them, and obviously, this year's probably not not been the best year for for that because of the you know this, the the high temperatures we've experienced. But I think you've got to just sort of play around and trial and play around with the compost on the market because the fact is we're we're going to be peat free in in literally a couple of years time. Yes, we want to be, don't we? But mm. when I, I took up my dahlias last autumn and put some into evergreen, mm -hmm. which is a peat free compost because i i always replant in fresh compost before i put them away for the winter so when i bring them out again they can get going in nice compost okay mm -hmm. and they they just shriveled and deteriorated whereas the ones that i hadn't put in that sort of compost were fine and then i tried sowing seeds into it and i just it just was just not the same is it no. I, I haven't learnt the watering, or uh, and it's hard work if you then have to add John in it, isn't it? It is, yeah. Because that's heavy. Yeah, that's heavy to add in and, and for, for your average person or elderly person, which I am now. I mean, it's it's heavy lifting those sacks of soil. Whereas Jack's magic is perfect, isn't it? So mm -hmm. I hope they can create something like that, which is totally peat-free and easy to use. 
Yeah. Some whoever does it will be on to a winner, won't they? They will indeed, yeah. And I think that's that's been sort of the the message that the the, the garden centres and nurseries are sending out to the the manufacturers that really they need to up the game, produce a product which is manageable, put better instructions perhaps on the on the the, the bags as well to help gardeners uh, manage this this new product as well. So. Fingers crossed yeah. that that's going to happen, but you, you're right. Whoever uh, manufacturer it is who gets the the combination and the um, the materials right will uh, will 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 do well. But John Innes is just a formula; it's not a make, is it? That's so correct. Yeah. So John Innes, it was in the 1940s or early 50s, was a formulation of of, of certain uh, quantities of of loam and and, and peat and other. Um, fertilizers wasn't it and that was the standard but of course they've sort of changed now quite a bit um and they've been it's sort far of more sandy isn't it it is yeah they've re- been reformulated and of course they haven't got the, the peat element in there as well so that's been replaced by effectively peat free products so big learning curve for, for, for john in is and a lot of i know a lot of our customers are fans of that product um and i certainly will use it as and when necessary yeah. so yeah well, we always used to say, Chris, that in for the winter containers, mm-hmm. don't use the multi-purpose compost, but do use John Innes. Yep. So back in the day, I always used to use that, but I found it quite heavy to lift the bags yep. um, and then lift the pot, if you like, if the pot was terracotta. Um, but it, it, it always had good drainage, so that's why we liked it, I think. Yep. So perhaps I should go back to that. Maybe yes, that might be a good uh, good option. Uh, moving away from the, the peat free other option at the moment until they've uh, they've they've sorted it out as well. And I was going to say, Kathy, whilst we're just still on pots, um, crocking. Um, there's been quite a lot written quite recently, actually. Um, the Consumer magazine, uh, Gardening Witch, talked about whether crocking is actually essential these days. I know TV Garden Monty Don's had a few things to say about it. What, what's your thoughts on on crocking pots? Oh gosh, I'm not I'm not up to date with what other people are saying, but I <laughs> I think that in a small container, mm-hmm. I hardly bother because it takes up space as long yep. as there's something covering the drainage hole. Because what you don't want to do is to block the drainage hole with roots. Yep. Um, yep. Otherwise, you've got a bath. So basically, that's how I think of it. But if it's a um, a larger container, I would use I do use broken um, shards of mm-hmm. terracotta pot. Yep. But I also like, on a, is it a slightly different answer to your question, where you've got a huge container and some people might have some beautiful urns or they might have a chimney pot. I always put a false pot in the top. So all I'm doing is, is, um, it, is putting the compost in for that smaller container not filling the whole pot and it makes life a lot easier in the winter taking that smaller container um into the greenhouse to look after it rather than taking the big pot oh, that's, a good, that's a good tip that yeah sense. so i've got several pots like that mm. we, we we do that here with the uh, whiskey barrels you know you get the massive great whiskey barrels if you yeah sort of we use the plant trays just to fill the <laughs> bottom three three quarters of the space and then yeah just put some uh, compost over the top and put your plants in in the top and again just reduces the volume of product you need to use and also makes it so much lighter and easier to handle well if you say got here's an here's a nice idea for containers if you've got agapanthus which are not hardy so they are the evergreen ones yeah. and you need to take those into some sheltered area for the winter period i would be looking at a false inner to go into your whiskey barrel so i'd find a a very large plastic black container to go inside, fill that with the agapanthus, take it out for the winter and put a winter display of the hellebores in there, which is also in a black plastic pot or maybe bulbs, but so that you can swap them over. So the same pot can be used winter and summer Um, because it's hard to have one container looking good all year round, isn't it? Yeah. It is, yeah, very, very diff- yeah. The sort of ringing the changes by, by sort of dropping in a, 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 a yeah, a pot, a pot within a pot, effectively, Another, isn't it? Mm. A pot within a pot, yes. And agapanthus mm. can 
can grow big roots, can't they, eventually? They certainly can. And uh, this, there's a question of what, what do you do? Do you divide or repot? And it comes mm-hmm. to a point where you can't go any bigger with the pots, isn't it? Anyway, they, yeah. that's just my... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've got that problem in one of mine at home at the moment. It's staying in that pot now forever and a day. It's it's not going any bigger. <laughs> uh, yeah, good stuff. And I guess, well, spring bulbs will be coming into the garden centre imminently now. Have you got any favourite bulbs that you'd like to use in your planters, Cathy? I, I do, but monk jack have become a bit of a problem recently, so... Um, I, I probably, I mean, the hyacinths and daffodil could be fine. Tulips are a bit suspect. Um, but I very much like the dwarf tulips and the dwarf daffodils, to tell you the truth, because I think they don't, they don't flag in, we can get warm weather in April, can't we? And the bigger daffodils can flag. Yeah. But I like to extend the season. So with the tulips in you can get species tulips which will flower at the end of April, early May, or ones close to the species. And there's one particular one called Lady Jane, which is a beautiful, slender tulip with pink and white um, petals, which I think is particularly beautiful. And it goes into another moment too when it has its seed heads, but I'm not one for taking off the seed heads of of bulbs I'd rather like to enjoy the silhouette of them so there's that aspect and some of the dwarf daffodils the later ones like Hoera which is multi-headed only about eight or ten inches high and comes back year after year that's a really beautiful one and some of them have I've got pink trumpets which I'm very fond of the, the miniatures I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Yep. So although you can have daffodils in flower in January, which you, you could easily do, um, you can also have them in flower in April and May. So in your big whiskey barrel, Chris, why don't you plant some early daffodils like January Gold or what's Weinveld's early sensation in mm-hmm. the front half of it? Yep. Don't, don't multi-layer, just think half. The front half have an early daffodil and the back half have a daffodil which is going to come out in April, like Pipit, P-I-P-I-T, it's gorgeous, lemon, mm-hmm. yellow and white, yeah. and then just simply reverse the barrel. So <laughs> oh, you're yeah, a, going yeah. over bit is at the back yeah. and the nice fresh bit Excellent. is at the front. I mean, that's, that's simple, but yeah, rather than layer them and have a mess everywhere, just have half and half. That's, That's a great brilliant. idea, and that, Kathy, is why you were you were crowned on the front of your cover as the uh, the Delia Smith of recipe gardening. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> just a few years of experience. Yeah, as well. That that sort of helps. Um, on on the pots again, just just finally, finally, um, feeds and, and sort of maintenance. What's what's your 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 big uh, job yeah. for for that? What what do you feel we need to be doing? Well, well if I'm plant if I'm planting for the summer. I will add in water gel. I am not sure what the environmental issues of that is. You can probably tell me. I don't know whether anybody's ever discussed it. But it must be some sort of substance that doesn't disappear. It is a a water polymer, isn't it? But that's how Saudi Arabia was greened up in the 1980s, and that's why um, it looks so green now. I think it's got a... I think mixed with the right sort of materials, it's, it's fine, isn't it? It's a manageable... Uh, products but uh, i think you've got to be careful how much you use you don't want to be overzealous with your uh, quantities but is, is it a plastic chris is it a plastic staying in the garden it, it the the derivative is it's definitely inorganic so it doesn't break down but i don't actually know the yeah. the, the chemistry of the, the product but it's it does stay around a while but it eventually does because obviously um certain areas you know have to be uh, the soil has to be re-improved, if you like, with more water-retaining qualities. But you change yeah. the whole I mean, I, I, demographics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've never asked the question before, and I've, I have wondered. But anyway, in the summertime, I use that in my containers, and I'm sure it helps, especially in hanging baskets. Mm-hmm. Um, and I use a long-term feed in them in the summertime as well. But, of course, the next year, that's not working. It will only last the one, the one summer, and it doesn't work in winter because of the temperatures. So then I would feed with a, a, a folia or, or a, a normal liquid feed the next year. But you can't, there's two, two issues with containers. One, you have to water, 
most all hot. And two, you have to feed. I mean, nobody gets up in the morning and goes through the whole day without food or water, do they? Indeed. It's very true. In this yeah. country. Yeah. No, no, that's right. I mean, you might not get much food, but you'll certainly get a drink. drink. Yeah. And you can't yeah. survive without two of them. And the more, the better you, you look after them, the better they will perform on the whole. So um, I don't have the answer to everything, but I do think you have to do be, be able to do those two things fairly regularly. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are ways of getting around it by putting your containers in shade in this very hot weather, which we've had, um, or taking them down if they're hanging, if it's very windy. But basically, water and feed is, is terribly important. And I know you, know you you quite often see containers, which where people have put say like glass beads over the top of the soil, or maybe coloured gravels. I'm guessing they're using them kind of a bit like a mulch and kind of a bit like a decorative item. Do you think they help at all? Um, they certainly are fun to look at. Uh, Again, you don't want to throw some of that stuff away, I suppose, because it would, you know, into your soil because it would remain there. Um, so I, I've used them in the past. Um, yeah, it, it, if it adds, if it adds a bit of fun, I mean, I use gravel in the garden as a mulch as well as compost because um, in certain areas it deters the slugs and snails, which is a valuable <laughs> lesson. Yeah, that's definitely. Um, but but in containers, I I I don't use mulches on the whole, um, I, and you know if you're talking about a long term container, people say oh remove the top half inch of the soil and mm -hmm. replenish. Well, it's surely difficult to remove the top half inch if you've got roots growing there, isn't it? Yes, especially. So I just you... tend to, I just tend to water and feed it. I mean, yep. mm -hmm. if you look after that, I think that, that's the main lesson i could give to people i always get a bit worried if you use mulches and uh, especially the decorative ones you can't actually see the soil and that gives you a very false sense of what's actually happening you know where your roots are and that's the most important part of the plant isn't it really especially weather wise we've yeah. had over the last few weeks yeah kathy you what is the question that you you get most asked by your your visitors to your garden <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's, it's a question. Um, oh, you! How much help do you have in the garden? Because people <laughs> are a bit overwhelmed when they come round and think, "Oh, surely they don't do it all by themselves." Um, and they want to be told, "Oh, we've got sort of an army of gardeners." <laughs> so yeah. the answer the answer to it is that we have we have one person helping once a week. In fact, it's not the answer. We have two people helping half a day a week, so that equals one day a week. Um, and, oh, oh, do you do the rest yourself? Well, yes, we do. And so they, they feel uncomfortable then because <laughs> because they, they realise how much work is involved. Well, there is masses of work involved in the garden, isn't there? there is. And it's been hard work this summer just watering in yeah. the evening mm -hmm. because it's been so hot. Yeah. And you have to let it cool down, and you're just wanting to to flop yourself Indeed. by then. Yeah. Anyway, that that's the question that gets asked. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And have you got any tips or sort of points that you'd make to gardeners wishing to open their gardens to the public? Um. Well, I think through the National Garden Scheme is is a very worthwhile way of doing it. Yeah. But my tip would be that make sure there is somebody who's going to do the teas and cakes because. That's very much part of the, the garden visit experience, isn't it? Mm. And you can't, it's hard work doing it all yourself because you can't talk to people and also sort of be serving them tea and coffee. Tea yeah. And cake. No, yeah. you're not wrong. So get, get help, get a, get a group of people who are willing to help. Brilliant, thank yeah, you. Okay. And um, actually, that takes us actually on to the, to the baking side. You, you do make some amazing. Cakes, Kathy. I mean, I've enjoyed them when I've, I've visited, but and obviously we mentioned earlier about edible flowers. This this wonderful cooking and gardening crossover. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a lovely combination. How how do you feel that that works so well within within your garden? Well, it's it's fun being able to forage the garden for 
the cake and I use rose petals to make a rose petal cake, only scented roses. All, all yeah. roses are edible, but you, you should only use the scented ones because they've got the, they'll give you the flavour. Gertrude Jekyll is my favourite one. Um, but any scented rose will do. Um, it, it's just nice to be able to say that you've got, you've been able to go out into the garden and we're eating the garden, which you've come to enjoy, but here they are in the flavours in the cake. So I harvest the lavender and make lavender and lemon drizzle cakes endlessly. Or I love lavender with apricots, fresh apricots and marzipan, so I've got that as a cake. And then raspberry and elderflower is another combination that I really enjoy. Um, and for those people who are gluten-free, there's a tangerine cake that I make. You'll see it on the internet as an orange cake, but I like using tangerines because the skins are nice and thin. And then I put an orange blossom water mixed with marmalade in the, in the centre of the cake. So it's dairy-free, it's gluten-free, and it's easy to bake for me. So mm. And all these cakes that I have have recipe cards with them so people can go away and bake their own if Brilliant. they like the idea. Excellent. And are there any sort of chefs or recipe books that you draw your inspirations from, or is it just trial and error? Um good question um i think i I, i'm i don't make fancy cakes they're all basically victoria sponges with a difference (laughs) i don't use oil yeah (laughs) and so you know if if there's a glass of plums on the trees the apricot cake will become a plum cake with cinnamon and ginger with the marzipan so it's just adapting i'm afraid i'm i just make them up Brilliant. Yeah. I, I think that's often the best way, though, isn't it? Sometimes you really make something that, you think, wow, that really is a good combination, and it's only through trial and error that we make these discoveries, isn't it? Yeah. And if I was to put you on the spot about your, your favourite bake, do, do you have one? Well, the tangerine cake is mm. a nice one because it's so tangy. Mm. Um, you, I didn't make up this recipe, but I have adapted it. Um, so you need, I have to think, I always do double the amount, so I have to halve them today. Um, you take tangerines, put them in the microwave, cook them, then blitz them up with five eggs, five large eggs. <clears throat> I think it's 400 grams of tangerines and caster sugar and ground almonds. And that's it. Gosh, that's that you're using the whole whole of the skin and the mm. inside and it's just very fresh tasting. Sure. And because it doesn't rise very much, I put two on top of each other with a bit of marmalade in between, tangerine marmalade, which oh. I buy from things with, mm. and add the orange blossom water in it mm-hmm. and that just gives it an extra tang. And it's it's lovely as a morning. It's lovely any time of the day. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you were having a dinner party, you could put some creme fraiche with it if you wanted to um but so long as you're you're not dairy free if you were dairy free just don't bother with the creme fresh oh that sounds perfect so that's my that's my tip that's and I'm, I'm sal- an I'm, cake. yeah and i'm salivating as you're describing that that's, <laughs> that's a lovely 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 recipe um gather we we like to put our expert uh, guests on the spot so it's that question we ask at the end of our, our podcast um if you're ever stranded on a desert island which plant or plants would you <laughs> be with and, and, and why? It's going to be, a, I suspect this might be a bit tricky for you. <laughs> I was very amused by this question. Um, and my mind immediately went to one plant. So here we go. Lavender, English lavender. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because, because it's, well, it's, it's a lovely format, isn't it? The, mm-hmm. the silvery leaves, the flowers, yep. the seed heads. But I, would eat I would eat the flowers. So if I was able to have um chicken or lamb, I would add it in the flavour of the cook of the, the, the pot of that I was using, whether it was you know, with, it was a casserole or whatever it was I was cooking up on my desert island or with <laughs> fish as well. But it it goes savoury and sweet. So it's it's lovely mm. as an addition to that. You could make 
I, I use it all the time with apples to make lavender jelly. I make a tea of it. So all you've got to do is to add some boiling water to the flowers and you've got lavender tea. Um, and if you have it with, if there were some apricots growing on this island, then, you know, it'd be lovely with the apricots. There's all sorts of things I would do Gosh. with lavender. It would be my staple flavour. I think it's got such a wonderful scent, hasn't it, lavender? When you walk past a few bushes of lavender, oh, it's so, yeah. so nice. It's pretty drought tolerant as well, which might be useful on that uh, on that desert island as well, perhaps. On oh, my I desert know. island, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's it. And um, Kathy, have you any funny tales or jokes you'd like to share with us today? Oh, well, Chris would understand this one, okay, Chris, because I know you have a water background <laughs> from our days of working together. Indeed. Um, <laughs> we we have been lucky to have Clive Nichols coming to photograph the garden from time to time, both in winter and in summer. And he was here once in, I think it was May, taking photographs of our formal garden. And the light can be so beautiful around the fish pond there. It's a formal fish pond. Mm -hmm. But the water fountain in the middle of it, from time to time, doesn't work. Have you ever come across that situation? You're... The sound the pump yes. yeah, the pump gets you. blocked and, and <laughs> no water goes. For some reason for some reason it gets blocked. It's been going for five minutes and then it, all of a sudden it stops. Well Clive comes before dawn in the morning to take these photographs and he gets gorgeous light. But Simon was the one who knew how to start the fountain, but only for about thirty seconds before it would stop. So poor old Simon had to get up before dawn as well and the two of them he explained to Clive what was about to happen and Clive gave him the thumbs up that the photograph was about to be taken and Simon put the water on it's a little distance of the electrics to where Clive was anyway Simon got the fountain working Clive took the photograph and within 30 seconds it was all gone off again so this photograph appeared in a magazine a few months later and uh, we always laugh at the idea of a, Simon having to get up so early, and B, <laughs> the, the, the wonder of the photograph. Yeah, really. that, that, if people knew what uh, what work went into that, what planning, <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's, great. that's a great story, thank you. Cathy, it's, it's been a real joy uh, chatting with you. I mean, obviously, yes, our, our paths have cross, crossed a number of times when I was working on gardening magazines and uh, the reference there was to, to water gardening where we did a, I think we did a feature on indoor water features and outdoor water features with fogging machines and these wonderful... They're the misters. Oh, yeah, misters, they're when they were really popular. They were uh, great, weren't they? We had some great fun doing some photography. Uh, your, your wonderful uh, garden house. So thank you very much and, and thank you for your time today and um, I suppose the question, you know, our, our listeners on on Dig it will obviously would love to come to your garden. Can you perhaps give us a, the idea of the the, the details of the uh, the website and where they can find more details of your your amazing garden? Well, the website is kathybrownsgarden dot com. So it's k a t h y b r o w n s garden dot com, and we have advanced booking. So we're open on a Tuesday through September and also end of August I think it's the 30th um, we're not open next Tuesday but we are for every other Tuesday until the end of September and also Saturday September the 3rd Perfect. Um, so we have morning sessions and afternoon sessions so come on either of those times and enjoy the teas and cakes that are here brilliant thank you very much Th Kathy. thanks that's Kathy. been brilliant thank you Today's show was brought to you by Buckingham Garden Centre and Nurseries. The show was hosted by Chris Day and Peter Brown. The show was produced by Peter Brown. And our thanks to Chilton Music Therapy for providing the music. Thanks for listening. At Chilton Music Therapy, we want everyone to know the difference that music can make in their lives. From parents and their premature babies in hospital to grandparents with dementia. We provide music therapy and community music services to people of all ages and needs across England. We work both digitally and in person in people's homes, care homes, schools, hospitals and hospices. Find out more at chilternmusictherapy.co.uk.